So we're looking at our most kind of popular and most engaged with tweets of the month. So you, you, you were involved in a particular project, so we can't, we can't name players. Um, but, but Chris, it's been, it's been kind of to and throwing out on tour. Some of the biggest stories from Mizuno in the last couple of years have actually not been the players we sponsor, but the ones that we don't, that play the product. So there's been a little bit of change, isn't there, in the last month or so. So we've, got, we've, we've kind of a, a player has left and, and a couple more have come in our direction. Yeah, it's always, I love Mizuno because even though we don't necessarily go after everybody, it feels like the second somebody has an opportunity to try something else, they come after us. So you're right, it's, it's, a, it's a constantly revolving door of who's in, who's out, between obviously we have our players who we know we're in, but then every year it becomes in the off season, who's going to show up with what, because you know, obviously we're, we're a company that gets approached a lot. I'm sure Matt gets approached all the time, but then you're almost a little bit hands off from there to see what's actually going to show up in the bag at any point and what's not, and what's going to leave somebody's bag. And you're right. This last month, there's been some, some entrances and some exits and it's, it's always going to be like that. And that's, that's part of what we're, what we're used to, but at the same time, we out we know our product is so good. That's going to end up in a lot of really good players' hands, which we've definitely proven out over the last couple of weeks. So, just a, a little shout out to uh, Rob Brooks at Golf Nation. He's very good at picking up on all these little details, isn't he? So, places like say Rob Brooks Golf Nation, Golf WRX. If somebody wants to find out who's in and who's out, that's probably a good place to look, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. There, it's amazing how quickly things happen. Like, I mean, certain things we actually get alerted to because of a story on from Rob or from Golf WRX. Cause that's what I mean is we're a little bit hands off because when you, when you aren't contracted with the player, you know, there's a level of distance you want to keep and a level of, um, I guess, you know, respect. And, you know, if they want to come to you, great. We're not going to be overbearing with them. So oftentimes we find out secondhand, but sometimes it's good news. Sometimes it's bad news, but always it's, it's, we're there to help and we're there to help people get the right product in their hands as much as possible. And, and I think, it. Go on, Matt. So I was just going to add, I was going to say that it's interesting for us as well, because sometimes when we've worked with a player away from a tournament, you know, and then, I mean, we've had it before where we've gone out to the, the, the start of the season, the first two, and a player has turned up with a set or, or, or a product that we perhaps worked with them five, six months ago on, and they've only just found their way in the bag. And we're, you know, we're, we're as surprised as everyone that they've found their way into the bag or vice versa. You know, it's not always, I think sometimes think that you're always doing that particular job at that particular tournament, but, you know, they, that can be, five six months ago but it can only just find its way in the bag once you've once you've had time once you've had um the right amount of practice and trust to then put it in place so yeah we we sometimes we're as surprised as everyone <laughs> so you, I mean, you had quite a good result from your trip didn't you matt so you know the, you didn't get an immediate return did you because i know you've worked with the player put a bit of time in pre-christmas i think that was or was it back in january december yeah so december we first uh, we first touched base and that really was kind of where the uh, main hub of the work went on you know we had we had a really good um we had a really good bit of a uh, bit of time a good session um getting things in place and then it was a case of just the fine tweaking you know being there on hand as 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 chris has already said there it's 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 quite a nice mix in in being able to jump in when need when need be but then also being able to kind of disappear and say look that's that's the product and that's you know that's where we want it to be and then le and kind of put the ball in their, their court and just say, look, if you need anything, we're here. But the product, it, it, you, you could kind of have so much pride in the product that you can afford to step back a little bit and say, well, you know, go and do what you need to do. Go and practice or go and play, you know, go and do that in your own time. And we're not conscious of being overbearing or, you know, you're kind of always looking over your shoulders. Is it all right? You know, something better. Because at the end of the day, you, you have that kind of uh, that pride in the product that what you've done stacks up and then, you know, go play golf. What, what's the what's the value of that to us then, Chris? So you know, we've had a we've had a, an, an interesting couple of weeks now. One player has dropped the irons. Two more very very high profile players have put the irons back in play. You know, quite clearly, even on this conversation, it's a little bit awkward because we can't say names. Um, are, we, are we? I always sort of take the view that humbled isn't quite the right word but you just have to be very appreciative of people of that level would choose to play your clubs 
and you accept that at that level, those guys are most likely going to perform really, really well with whatever they've got in their bag. Do, do you think that having the right kit makes a big difference to these guys? I mean, or is it just a sense of pride that they've chosen to, to use our equipment? I mean, I think it's it's a little bit of a little bit of both. I think these guys, especially when you t- when you're talking those top level guys, those top 15 players in the world and stuff like that, they they know they they know what's going to work for them, and they're not going to show up with something that doesn't work for them. So I think there's there's a there's a level of pride when they come to you and want to try your stuff, and at the same time, as, as Matt mentioned, you know we've got a lot of confidence in what we've made. So to be able to, to present the product and you know, we're there if we need it, if we need to tweak it, great. But I think it speaks a lot for basically Mizuno's reputation in the, in the entire market that a, cu- a player would say, I, you know, I, I know your product's going to work. Let's try this out and then let's, let's see if it does. So for us, we take a lot of pride in that. And, you know, obviously with it, it stings a little when somebody leaves, but all of this is completely on the player. So if the player wants to leave, we, we have to know that it's a, it's a fragile thing out there. You know, you can't just hang your hat on, well, this guy who happens to have chosen the set of irons is going to always choose the set of irons. It could be that he loses a little form and just needs to look at something different. So there, there's a lot of things that always happen, but what we appreciate is that we're, we seem to always be in the mix of one of those, one of those companies that I, if I'm going to try something, if I'm going to experiment, we should be a part of that experiment. And how, how is it working with a real elite level player, Matt? Was that was that maybe your first time of that kind of almost like moving up a division? Uh, well, I mean, if you go look on uh, on previous results, it doesn't get much higher than that, does it? So, yeah, you know, I mean, it's it's a it's it's the enjoyment side of my role. Um, but yeah, you have to have the background uh, product in place to be able to put yourself in that position in the first place. So. You know the, the the hard work is is done with the product, and then yeah, I mean it's 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 great fun. You know, it's to be able to to be able to stand and watch a player hit, you know, 20, 25 shots that are landing on top of each other makes your job very easy. Um, but it also then can you can you tell can you tell straight straight away that if you didn't know the player and they that particular player turned up and started hitting the ball like that, is there a noticeable difference? Uh, I mean, everyone, everyone nowadays, if you're, if you're on the European tour and you're kind of at that elite level, your, your ball striking is very good. You know, there are things that have to be in place in order for you to be in that position. Um, but yeah, I mean, that was, it, it's just so consistent, you know, and, and you could, you could stand there and not watch the golf thing and just look at numbers popping up on, on track, man. And you'd be going, okay, this is this is going to be a fairly easy job because everything is just so uniform. You know, every shot, there's nothing that pops up where you go, hmm, was that was that player? Was that product? It, it, it gives you that tunnel to work with that is the, the amount of feedback and the kind of, okay, I didn't quite get that. And you can see it. You know, it's just, it's, it's so easy to work with when you've got that level of um, precision. I'm curious, Matt, as a, play, as a player at that level, basically asking you to fit and give recommendations or are they coming saying here here are my specs here's what i know here's my launch conditions match these like what's the give and take there so i was very very surprised actually i was i was uh, pleasantly surprised because as you say i thought um in my mind when i was kind of prepping for our first session you know i thought it'd be very okay this is what i like this is what i want to see go do it um, but it was very open, you know, the conversation was very, very open. It was, it was to and from, you know, okay, I think this, and you go, okay, cool. You know, I think this, and it was very, very um, uh, open is the, right, is the right word. I mean, it was, it was fun to be a part of because I felt like I could put a little bit of input in and it would be taken as, as it should be. You know, I didn't mm-hmm. feel like I was just, okay, let's, let's try and match what you had. There was a couple of little things in there that I was able to say, you know, okay, well, let's, what do you think of this? And, you know, we were talking about golf swing and, and it was, it, it was a lot more, um, uh, a lot more uh, flowing than I perhaps thought it would be, which was great. That, Again, really fun to be a part of because, you know, we, we, we walked away thinking that was pretty, there was a lot of positive there that we were actually able to, to perhaps bring to the table that weren't there before. And, and what, a, what a great thing to be able to do when you're working with someone at that level. 
And it's got to give you a little bit more confidence that you you came to the conclusions together of what was working. I know one of the yeah. things that has been a little bit of a struggle just during during all this, you know, new restricted travel, restricted access to players, restricted access to the range is almost a, there's it's almost felt like we're a step removed where a lot of players are sometimes asking for tweaks, asking for something new. And it's almost like we have to present a new product and then stand back and wait for feedback. I love it that you're able to, you know, have that back and forth because that's really when you can dial in things that's basically, you know, something they might not know they were looking for and something that a new club might offer that they didn't realize was different. So I think that's a very good take and a good approach to getting the right clubs in people's hands. Yeah. And I, and I, I always think personally, it's nice to have, to have the coach kind of or to have the coach's input perhaps because half the time you know the player knows what he's trying to think he knows what he was trying to get to and then you can kind of fill that void through equipment sometimes you know if you say right you know I'm feeling like I want to do this or perhaps my bad shot gives me this then you can you know with with knowledge of of, of weights and shafts and, and different heads you can kind of work to bridge that gap again a little bit better as opposed to just going in blind and saying right this is what i see this is what i think you know if you if you can kind of the more the more you know about the play you know the more um kind of backstory and back history to to good shots bad shots what you're working with what you want to feel then all of a sudden yeah again now we've got super consistent track man numbers a very consistent move and quite a quite a, a, a precise view on what they want to feel all of a sudden you know all of these little parts of the jigsaw kind of fit in place and you go well that was really easy but only because of a b and c you know if you don't have all the parts of the puzzle then it can be a bit of a, a bit of a nightmare but if you've got things as clear and precise as they are sometimes it's, it's it all of a sudden looks very easy nice mm. And just just to just to elaborate a little bit as well. So, as as well as getting a couple of re really good players on board with the irons, and we, you know we, we hope we hope that's for a period of time, and, and early results suggest that should be the case. Um, there was actually a win for an old set of irons as well, Chris. The the, the MP fives as well, European tour last week. Another another on contracted guy, a uh, set of MP fives came floated back to the top. Yeah, yeah, that's all. That's always something cool, and and you know it's. Obviously, good, good, good thing or bad thing that it's an older model, though, Chris. To me, it's a good thing. Like, I mean, I think there's there was nothing wrong with MP5s, and we weren't we weren't trying to fix a problem when we replaced MP5. So, to me, to to see someone who has the level of confidence that the MP5 has been in the bag for now, going on four or five years, it 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 speaks a lot to that club and that that player is that confident, and he's not looking for something else you know it if a player can have that level of confidence that this club is going to do exactly what I want then it almost takes one of those variables out of was it the swing was it the club it's you know if you know exactly what your product's going to do then that's just one more thing you can trust you don't have to worry about and just speaking to that player I know there's a there's a story he's told where he was playing a different set of Mizuno irons prior to that was, I believe it was the MP25s and I remember talking to him because he had switched from the 25s to the fives. And I asked why that was. And he said, I'll tell you exactly why. It was number 16 at Augusta. I hit a seven iron. I knew where it was supposed to land and it didn't land where it was supposed to land. And like that whole thing, it's because all of a sudden there was a question of, well, this club didn't do exactly what it should have done when I knew I put that swing. He needed to find something that did. And now that he has, he's trusted it for years. So I think it's a really cool thing when a player has that level of trust in product. And then, you know, obviously if they want to make some tweaks, if they're looking for something different, that's when Matt shows up and says, I want, I, here's what this new one will do. And obviously we'll always present new products to everybody, but you know, new isn't always better for everybody. Does that, does that mean somewhere in the Mizuno cupboards in HQ, there are multiple sets of MP5s just in case? There aren't yeah. many. Uh, there are a couple floating around. I know I personally have kind of stashed away a couple of sets that I found particularly beautiful just as eyepieces for myself. But uh, there's not there's not a lot floating around, unfortunately. We have, so we there, have, there, there's, we have a limited, there's a limited timeline then you on do. that particular story. Yeah, exactly. How many sets do you have on the truck, Matt? 
we have we have one set which is uh, padlocked away with uh, with someone's name on. <laughs> yeah. it, would that be the same player we're talking about? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, good, good. Yeah, Just, uh, uh, yeah. Hidden, that, that's, the, that's the only name that should be on that box, I think. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They seem to work. Um, so just what, what, while we're on tour, Chris, I mean, th this was going to be a driver conversation and it, it will turn into one now. So, so we'll have to cut this into chapters, I guess. Um, but the interesting one for me was looking at tour news. Mizuno launching a wood. I don't think we've ever started with a piece of tour news. Generally, of the last kind of few iterations, our, if we have some success on tour, it comes a little bit further down the track. You know, we're, we're transitioning, but we're not really a, you know, as you know, not known as a marketing first company, are they? Um, mm. But we actually did start off the week we launched the products and made it, I opened it up to media. Uh, Keith Mitchell, who was almost like the start of this whole story for Mizuno Woods, went out at the Sony Open, switch driver, and was um, top in driving distance that week. I think a lot of that, it, obviously, it's, it's exciting to have a tour story right off the bat. But a lot of that comes from what we're going to talk about for a few in terms of how we approach this product a little bit different. Because this time with this product, you know, it's typical for Mizuno is, you know, obviously when we launch product, the driver's life cycle is relatively short, you know, just you know, not just for us, but for everybody. So by the time a product is launching, you know, it's just now getting in somebody's hands. And, you know, a lot of players are relatively timid to make a switch particularly on a product that they know they like you know Keith with his ST200 was driving the ball fantastic and wasn't looking for anything different so we see that a lot with wood product when we bring something completely new to the table and say hey you, you like this but how about this but this launch was different because it was more of build upon what we had been doing. So I think that made the transition a little bit quicker for him and for other players as well. And it's, and with that, you've seen early adoption and great results right off the bat with it. Matt, you, um, you, you were even earlier, right? So that, that Keith Mitchell kind of gets the headlines. You were probably first out with the new drivers. I seem to remember a very early fitting session with um, Olivia Cowan, which which you did some videos with Peter Finch earlier in the year. Yeah, we were. It was it was a little bit of of, of bad timing for us to a point in that, um, with all the restrictions, we couldn't get a lot of people down to see us, and we couldn't get out to see a lot of people. The the only the only way that we could get out and see guys was through the tour. So uh, we were able to get out to the tour events, but you know, our, uh, the challenge tours and the tours that just sit below the European, the main tour, it was difficult to see a few guys. So we um, we actually did send a few options to those guys to test at home. Um, so we kind of did that, that, that bit of feedback remotely, which was a bit different perhaps, um, but still, uh, still a, a real positive outcome in that. Um, I think all but, all but one now, of our guys that were in 200 have now moved into into the Z uh, or the X in Olivia's case. Um, so yeah, so it's been it's been a nice switch, but not one that we're perhaps nor you know usually usually see because we're not able to get hand in hand and see these guys. But that will come. But um, for the for the Olivia sake of Olivia's a relatively easy fit, right? I'm watching Very. the videos and spending a bit of time <laughs> with her. That 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 can't yeah. be too intimidating. No, so again, I was quite lucky. Uh, she was out in um, Dubai. She was doing some practice and some work out in Dubai when I was over there a couple of weeks ago. So I touched base with her and, and yeah, she was still really, really pleased with it. I actually, we, we walked a few holes um, and yeah, it's it's just, uh, it's like frozen rope every time she hits a driver. It's, it's pretty cool. So yeah, she's really pleased with it. Um, and all the time that you've got, as you say, you know, working, working with guys or, or girls at that elite level, to see the the consistencies and the and the progression from each driver is 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 what you is what you do day to day for isn't it you know to see the gains that they have and and and, and are happy with it down the line so you can ask for chris you you watched um, matt's effort on the, in front of camera with olivia <laughs> yeah it was it was good and again like I remember you talking about all her numbers were like zeroed out. That makes it pretty easy when, again, we talk about minimizing variables. Like that takes a lot of variables out. If the strike is consistent, the path is consistent, the launch parameters are going to be very consistent. So then it makes it very simple to dial in something that works. 
Yeah. Yeah. I, I want to come back to something there as well. Because when we get into the two different drivers, the two different shapes, I just I just found it really interesting that Olivia didn't really conform to any of the norms because she actually she wasn't the normal ST two hundred and she didn't come from the X. So she mm -hmm. finished up with the X this time around. We actually played the two hundred G before. Hmm. So she came from a really different place, Matt. Uh, yeah, I think as long as Olivia uh, sees it going straight, it could be a it could be a frying pan. She just goes, <laughs> "Yep, I'll hit that." So yeah, she was pretty, <laughs> just call that really just call that one an early win. <laughs> yeah, pretty easy. <laughs> I'm just I, I flipped through some slides. I was just trying to remind myself little bits of the conversation to run through, and we were going to try and get Frederick Lindblom on because he's another guy that's had an early hit of the driver, and he he switched over. I and mean, he's a guy that launches at absolutely miles. But he's, 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 uh, he's not that close to you, Chris, so he's probably, probably a little early in the morning for him to join us. But I was just looking at the two videos, Matt. So Fred on his Instagram account so far on 3,572 views. Your little video, your first look with Matt McIsaac, you're beating him. You're up there 3,720, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> Hence, I you've earned your I, place on the call. I apologise for anyone that had to uh, listen to me for too long jabbing on. <laughs> influencer status i like it yeah absolutely maybe that's why i could get into dubai yeah <laughs> <laughs> i thought you did a nice job matt thank you um, which brings us to the previous iteration so when, when we're going through these presentations chris and we're, we're talking to a lot of the media guys and we're talking to retailers the general feedback is that mizuno must have had a really really good year in 2020 st200 really commercially and also kind of opinion wise, it seems to have strung a few people. Would you agree with that? Yeah. 200 is one of those where I'll never forget. Obviously I have a, a group that I like to golf with pretty regularly. And for the first time, I'd say early 2020, I heard somebody say, I've heard a lot of buzz about your new driver, which obviously, you know, people talk to me about Mizuno product all the time, but it's usually not around the driver. But obviously, I heard, people were hearing about it. People were hearing about results and how it was doing and basically getting interested in it. And I think a lot of that is because of how we've developed it and how we've told our story and how we've continued to evolve from year after year. Good driver to work with Matt 200. 200 was yeah I, I enjoyed 200 I thought it was um they've all been a, a progression don't get me wrong but I think the 200 was the one where it was you, you didn't mind going to the table with any other driver you know you go right okay you know I'm I'm pretty confident if, if you if you invest enough time with us on the range and we can dial things in and we can tweak things in then this would be up there if not better than most other drivers at the time so that was a really that was a that was a fun one to work with for sure so we'll come round to the, the development of it all, Chris. But again, I would think that it's quite a hard year when you're launching driver to follow a really, really strong driver. You're almost better off if, you know, you, you could instantly go and pick the flaws in it. But it's, it's a little harder when you've got the limits you've got. There's a conversation now circulating, isn't there, about um, re reeling the drivers back again. Mm -hmm. So when you've actually taken it to such extremes and we've already got these limitations and you have a good product like that, must be relatively challenging to take it to the next level from the development side obviously it is a challenge when we, when you know something works and you know people are happy with the product in their hand there's always a little bit of um apprehension to to move on from there so it's a little bit tricky on the development side of what parts are we going to mess with and what parts are we not going to mess with but i think we had a really good plan in place but from the marketing side and from the, I'd say, overall golf landscape, yes, we had a good year, but I mean, we're still not the biggest player in the woods. The fact that a lot of people have heard good things about it, the number of people who have heard good things is not as many as the number of people who have actually hit it. So I always feel like it, it actually helps us from that side because you can hear momentum building and you can hear, you know, you know, intrigue of maybe that last one wasn't for me, but maybe this one will be, but because I'm starting to get confidence in it. But, you know, from the development side, you got to be careful that you keep that momentum going and you don't do any missteps. Yeah. I mean, in, in, in some ways being a slightly smaller player on the driver market helps us out, right? Because we haven't got half, half the market already playing last year's model. Most people have only probably just dipped their toes in and heard some good things. So there isn't the pressure. Say we were market leader in drivers. The following year, all of a sudden, you've got to change the color, the name, the technology story. Everything has to change, right? It convinces people it's bigger, better, longer. 
Yeah, and we're not the company that, you know, this year we have a, you know, a whole rack of last year's product at a discounted price next to it, just because that's really not how we've, how we've built up our driver market. You know, we're not the one who wants to flood a retailer with stuff. We're not going to, you know, just, you know, push a lot of product on a lot of people. We're going to get it in the hands of people who work, who, who it works for, and then continue to evolve from there. So hopefully those people are excited about it. And anyone who's seen those people have good results are intrigued by it or the new one. I'm probably skipping a chapter of the story now, but I, I liked some stuff you said when we were doing the pre-recorded videos, which was, you know, when you, especially when you've got your players, you know, if, if you look at the tour as a small sample of what we encounter out in the market as well, knowing that you're going to a player with something that's not too different to what they have in the bag when they're happy is a massive advantage, right? So going with somebody like Keith, knowing that you're not going to take him something that's a different shape, different color, different sound, that, that gives you a really good starting point. Yeah, the biggest challenge with Keith, I think that the largest hurdle to overcome was when he first put a Mizuno driver in play, to be honest. So, you know, he was somebody who, if, if there's one highlight to Keith's game more than anything, it's his driving ability. Great ball speed, straight hitter, consistent. You know, it's always been the club that, you know, has helped propel him forward. That's where most of his strokes are gained is, is off the tee. So the biggest challenge for us was just, getting one into his hands that was going to be the first Mizuno driver into his hands. So starting with the ST190, it was a product that he tried it kind of out of obligation, not necessarily, you know, looking to change, but it worked. And because it worked, he played it, he got the numbers he wanted and, and he had a lot of success with it. Then what I think has helped us going forward is that we haven't brought something completely I won't say completely new, but something completely unique to the table each time. You know, what we've done is we said, here's what we liked about your ST190. Here's where we saw room for improvement on it. So with the 200, we brought a new face material that's going to give a little bit more ball speed. We added a little bit of stability to it. And then from the 200 now to the STZ, again, we're going to deliver very similar launch parameters. But if we can boost that speed up just a touch more and retain a little bit more speed on miss hits, we know it's going to do everything your 200 did just that much better. So that has helped us in terms of gaining confidence and, you know, working from generation to generation, making sure that our product continues to evolve and, and continue to work its way into players' hands. And I know Matt can speak a ton to that. Matt, yeah. I've, just, I've just popped the new slide up, which is um, just to remind me to talk about the players. And you've had a, you've had a pretty big role to play in this. So when, when we started this project, so let's, let's, let's just change the converse, point of conversation a little, Chris, before we enter this one. Yeah. Which is the driver isn't, this is quite a long story. And it's, you know, we're, we're going back a number of years and we're, where we set the pathway that's finished where we are. There was a point where, because of our Mizuno's incredible history with irons and most played on tour, which then other companies can see the value of that and come into the marketplace. And that, that no longer becomes an affordable proposition for a, a manufacturer like Mizuno. We're, we're left with a scenario where the exception of the players that are contracted is the guy that plays the driver. So we might've had, so Chris Wood may have had a good few years with Mizuno played the driver. I think he won the PGA championship with the Mizuno driver. However, I could see on the US end when you turn up at the US Open, the surprise was, wow, there's a Mizuno player with a Mizuno driver because they weren't used to seeing that. Because, so we, we, we made a call to transition that at the end of a period of time, we wanted that the exception would be the guy who didn't play the Mizuno driver rather than the exception being the guy who did play it. So I'm just, I'm just looking at some examples from the end of last year. Matt, feels like we've already arrived at that place. Yeah, and I think it, from from my end of it is it's being able to year on year <clears throat> kind of create more trust with players. And you know, when you when you march up to on the range and you say, "Hey, what do you think of this?" Their instant their instant reply isn't dread of oh, what's <laughs> what's what's Matt going to get me to hit here? You know, it's actually <laughs> quite a, it's actually quite an exciting. Uh, liaison here where you've gone actually that looks quite cool let me see this let me let me try and hit it and and with what we do that's such a key um such a key relationship to have with as many people as you can because one you get a lot of feedback from 
different players on what we like and don't like, which is great. But also, the guys out on tour talk as much as we do when we play golf with our football on a Saturday. You know, so so having that again year on year that 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 progression of being able to hopefully get some more players using it, but also more players using it well. You know, it's all well and good tying people in and saying you have to use this, but you want to see success stories from that. And that's, again, with Keith, 326 yards, leading the driving stats, you know, things like that that are all of a sudden popping up, that that then uh, starts a story with a whole bunch of players that perhaps if we rewind three, four years ago, we wouldn't have been able to have. I'm just looking here. So Adrian Sadia, probably top ranked of the European guys at the moment? Uh, yes, yeah. So Sadie played the prior generation, but he definitely is playing the ST200. Was Adrian yeah. playing the 190 before that as well? No. So his first one we got him into was the 200. Right. Okay. So we're, we're, one, we're one generation in. And I believe I've seen posts from Adrian saying that he switched or he's testing at least. Uh, so he's got it at the moment. Again, he's one of the ones we haven't had. Uh, we, we, we haven't touched no face to face. With in person yet but we've uh, we've sent him a couple of options which by all accounts are, are working nicely and i think he's been uh, he's been hitting some balls behind the scenes and, and getting it dialed in so um yeah see he seems good, to be pretty good ball striker as well adrian correct he is yeah he's a strong player yeah he's he's uh he is a he's an earth mover you know when you when you stand next to him hit balls you know he compresses it really nicely and he's a yeah he's a he's a, a strong player which when again when we're going over to keith I was talking to someone just last week when, when I was out in, in the desert and he instantly mentioned it actually before I said anything. He said, oh, I grew up with Keith. And he said, uh, he said he's, a, he's a strong, strong bull striker. And just things like that that you can put in people's minds. The irons, yes, given. But now when you're talking about proper bull strikers, you know, proper players in, you know, top 100 in the world that are, that are, that are hitting your driver and hitting your driver well, Again, that's the, that's, the, that's the conversation we all want to be at. So look, looking at my little sheet of players then, so I'm just thinking that probably the, the headline acts there, Adrian Sadia, Keith Mitchell, an obvious one. Really become, Keith really becomes the poster boy almost for Mizuno drivers at this point, I think, because he's been on board from the start. He mm -hmm. was the guy that was brave enough to take a little chance and put something in play and bring the other guys along with him. Just going into his third iteration... Boho, good player, Chris, and, and, and improving each second season on PGA Tour now for Boho? Yeah, second full season on tour. Bo worked his way up from the Corn Ferry, but he's, he's one of those guys who he's been successful at every level he's played. So, you know, again, a great ball striker, a tall guy, you know, he, he really gets the ball moving. And he's one of those ones, it was actually interesting because he started – and, you know, I know Matt's mentioned it earlier where this year is a little bit different, where we're a little bit hands off in terms of the fitting and working someone into a new product. So the initial test with the STZ, he almost, you know, right off the bat, his first one where he just gave him a head to basically put on his shaft, it wasn't quite dialed in. But, you know, you typically, as Matt mentioned before, you like to start fresh with the driver. You don't like to just build off of a same for same specs. So he's one who once he got it and then kind of got on his own element where he then started looking at more of a tweak to it and understanding what that club does a little bit different and then dial in the proper shaft, the proper swing weight, all those things, get it dialed in for him. All of a sudden he's seeing significant gains from it versus his previous one, which he was very happy with. So he's someone who put it into play a couple of weeks ago for the first time and has had great finishes with every round with it. So, you know, again, a, an up and coming player, which, a lot of times when you're breaking the mold of a, of a prior reputation of a sort of, you know, brand of products, which Mizuno drivers and all honesty had a little bit of a reputation with, with a certain crew of, of tour players, it almost takes a fresh eye to then be able to break that reputation. And I think Keith, Adrian, um, Bo, they're great examples of guys who, you know, they weren't, I don't want to say, soiled by our reputation where they weren't turned off by a Mizuno driver they were just ones who were open to it and wanted to hit it and see if the numbers were there and for all of them we've seen that so with it, without going too much into sort of business backdrops and plans but the idea of this three-year plan that we'll, 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 we'll go back into that we're two seasons into a three-year project and we're looking you know it looks to me like 
from next season, I believe all the Mizuno contracted guys, European Tour, PGA Tour, will play a Mizuno driver. Have I got that right? Yeah, that's correct. So that was a that was a step that, again, you, you have to look at yourselves, you know, from the outside in, in terms of, you know, does a Mizuno player play a Mizuno driver? Do they support the brand? And do they support everything we're working towards? And for the longest time, you know, that wasn't the case. We had, you know, our top players played a very select number of our products. And while I understand how we got there in terms of, you know, if you just look business-wise, you know, irons represent X amount of our business and woods are a much smaller percentage of that. I understand why it's easy to say, well, then let's just focus on what works and, you know, don't go about something that might be a little bit more of a challenge. But we took a larger look from the outside in in terms of how can we become more of a golf brand because we knew we were developing great stuff. Our R and D team, what we do with different processes, different materials, how we design our woods, we know that they're going to work. So then it really just took a little bit of, you know, us having that confidence in the product to set the plan uh, forward in motion to allow the player who plays them, you know, wood to not be the exception, to be more of the rule. And in putting the pressure upon ourselves, to make sure these guys have a driver that they're comfortable with. Does that put pressure on R&D in a different way to kind of speed things up, make things better? I mean, you're always trying to be better, that's that's a given. But knowing that you now don't have a reverse, you don't have a side exit, there's no way but to get to the end of this pathway where your players have to play your driver. That, that, that does put a huge amount of pressure on the process to get this driver right. From the R&D side, I think it becomes more of a how do we improve what we know is already good versus how do we come up with a completely new story to tell. So, you know, if you're if you're wiping the slate clean with each launch where, you know, you don't have to worry about, you know, this player playing this driver, is he going to transition into the next one, you know if that's not something that you worry about, then your story has to become, well, what do we want to talk about for this one? So for years and years, it felt like we would almost wipe the slate clean and start with a brand new driver every year. But now that we've built this foundation of what is a Mizuno driver and how is it working and how are the tour players accepting it, now it becomes more of working with Matt, getting his feedback from players on tour, working with Jeff Cook on our side, getting his feedback with all of our players and saying, here's what works. Here's where we feel like, you know, it could potentially improve. So it, it, it's a new way of thinking from the R and D side in terms of working with feedback versus working with, you know, inside out versus outside in. If there was one thing, so my belief on the ST200 is it's the feedback we've had when we've been presenting to media and retailers is it's become known as a really good driver for the golf course. It's really straight, really reliable. The sound was the only thing that came back as some people, not all, some people thought there was a little bit of work left to do on the sound. So do you take that sort of feedback on or do you already know, did you know in your mind already that was something you wanted to improve on? We had an idea that the sound was different. You know, obviously with the 190, it was a very muted sound. It was a very, you you'd almost want to call it a more modern sound than the 200. If you look at the modern club head right now, the use of different materials and how and how just the construction has, has evolved from being fully titanium heads to having lots of different materials built into it. The modern sound has gone from a loud explosive sound to, I'd almost call it a quiet explosive sound. So a more muted, like a denser, more quiet feel, but at the same time you get this certain character so you know that the ball's coming off fast. So we knew from the 190 to the 200 that the sound was different. Obviously then you start comparing it to the whole industry and where the industry has evolved with sound. And I think in a year where we got a little bit louder, the industry got a little bit quieter, which again, just kind of makes ours different and makes it stand out sometimes it's a good thing but for some people that's not a good thing if you hit three drivers and ours is the only allowed one it might make you question why why are these ones from the big guys different than this one from the quote-unquote little guy so we knew that it was something we wanted to evolve and something that we wanted to tweak in terms of the sound for the new product you get any feedback on the sound matt or is that an irrelevance at all level 
No, no, not at all. No, because I mean, you, sound is feel, right? So you know, it has to feel right. You know, and it has to, it has to give you the right sensation through impact. We can, we can be a little bit more. We can control sound a little bit uh, on the truck with what we can do to the head. So we can tweak little bits, um, but yeah, ultimately it has to feel right. And I think the 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 new drivers versus the two hundred. I was I always use the word concrete. They do feel a bit more concrete like, you know, that sound. It, it, it's far from a ting. And I think that's definitely a, a kind of a, a an industry trait at the moment. Everything is becoming a little bit more concrete like, a little bit more um quietly powerful. You know, and I I think the 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 differences are it's it's brand to brand, but what is right to some might not always be right to you know what Jim likes and what Nancy likes might be two really different things. So you kind of have to cater for both. But I think ultimately, if you've got the sound right, then it's quite a pleasing noise. And, and regardless of what, what other people like, Chris, there's a little bit of Mizuno in that as well, which is you know we're, we're known for great feeling irons that really want to have the loudest driver in the world, do? You? No, and you know we are. I think we're probably more critical of ourselves than even the consumers are of us where we know what we want a product to sound like and feel like. You know, we, we talk about nothing feels like a Mizuno for a reason. And we believe that goes beyond just the iron world. That goes to the ball, the wedge, the driver, everything, you name it. We have a feel that we want to portray. And what's interesting is on the wood side, because it's a large bodied hollow club, you can vary that sound way more than you can in iron. So, you know, it's possible to make it extremely loud. It's possible to make it extremely quiet and hit all sorts of different, um, different sound characters throughout that. So when we're doing our design, we're looking at different rib structures, different materials, different processes. All of these things play a role in how that club's going to sound. And we'll have a stated sound goal. And that goal will be, you know, something that, you know, Matt mentioned, you know, more of a concrete sound, but then we have numbers to that, meaning we want to hit specific hertz, different frequencies of vibration at different modes, different decibels, and all of those dial into what we, what was the feel that we're looking for. So I think we really hit that right where we wanted to with the, with the STX and STZ line. Bearing in mind, it sounds different inside in the studio to outside as well. <laughs> Yeah, I think there, there is something. To what, what sound are you going for? On the basis that most people buy their driver inside in a cage, what, 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 where do you draw the line? Do you, do you make a product that sounds great in its natural environment or in testing environment? I mean, sound character is sound character, meaning like the frequencies it vibrates at are going to be the same indoors and outdoors. But I feel like indoors something that's a little bit louder is going to echo back more and you're going to get even that much it's going to almost amplify anything wrong with the sound so if you can get it to sound good indoors you know it's going to sound good outdoors it, it rarely goes the other way around <laughs> so going to look at this story go, go back to this idea you had chris so this is a this wasn't three individual driver projects. So if you could summarize best you can, I'm, I'm, I've popped the picture up there. This is a, yes. our film guy putting the promo spot together. And we kind of, you know, we, we, we've grouped the 190, the 200 and the new STZ together. Um, there's more to it than just product development, but essentially this is one project with three pauses almost. Is that, is that accurate? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a different approach to how you develop woods. It's a, you know, it's an advancement versus, uh, you know, a rethinking every year. So starting with the ST190, rather than having the end point of 190 be when you launch 190, we saw the end point of 190 a few years down the line. And what we wanted to try to do, or what we were able to do was actually advance this to where each launch was almost a, you know, a stake in the ground of here's where we are at this point in developing something that we know we're going to get to further down the line. So the 190 was where we were a year in, the 200 two years in, the STZ and STX three years in. So it, it really, it's a different way of thinking that becomes more evolutionary versus completely wiping the slate clean. And what's encompassed in that, you know, there actually was a moment where we sat down and said, okay, this is a three-year project. What does what that three-year project encompass? It's more than just the physical products. 
Yeah, so what, what I mean in that three-year project is that we're going to almost commit to a direction, meaning we know where we're headed and what that, what that involves, you know, internally, there's some changes that are involved in that as well, in terms of like the design team that's working on it, how that basically the CAD model that becomes the final molds, how that continues to evolve, rather than starting with a new mold and starting with a different head shape, we want to have basically one model that continues to grow. So, you know, looking, at the internal side from R&D, we actually put forth you know, a wood team that said, this is your project for the next multiple years. So how are you guys going to continue to you know, keep the same eyes on it? Because it's interesting when you, when you launch a product you know, from working from the engineering side, you always know some things where you almost run out of time being able to get exactly where you want it. So it almost, by putting the time frame years in advance or years into the future, you know immediately of, well, I ran out of time for this one, but I know exactly where I'm going to start for the next launch. So it, it makes the product, I think, get better and better, but also it gives us someone who liked the first one, knows that the next one, they should like everything they liked before and then some. So I think it just does a lot of things for just the confidence in our product and the confidence in our development cycle as well. I don't want to unveil too much of the inner workings of Mizuno, but there's some interesting little bits in that. And one of the ones for me was the team that are working on the project. So as, as a lot of people know, in Japanese culture, there's a lot of rotation of skill sets. You know, you, you, you can move from advertising to HR. You can move from HR to running a factory. That's, that's, the, that's, the, that's the model by which... Japanese companies evolve their staff. And that can also be true a little bit within engineering and R&D, correct? So you would have, you've worked in R&D, you know, you might be yep. working on irons one year, you might be working on the woods the next year. I've, I've just popped the picture of Kay up because Kay's yes. fundamental to this story. You're exactly right. I mean, I'm, I'm someone who I've, I've worked on, obviously irons were the main things I worked on, irons and wedges. However, you know, it, I've done multiple drivers as well. The interesting thing was I did a driver one year and then I didn't touch a driver again for two years later. So, you know, when did, you're did doing you that and when you're, <laughs> I wouldn't say I mucked it up, but I would say I didn't have this, the knowledge base that, of, you know, basically I had two years of not knowing what exactly had advanced from the manufacturing side, from the processes side. So by having someone like Kay Suji, who is an engineer who's been with Mizuno for years, I've worked very closely with him for a number of years. In the U.S., he lived here for a little bit, learning our market as well as living in Japan, understanding that market. I know he's traveled to Europe a number of times, understanding that market. To have him be in charge of our wood line has been very valuable because there's no reset of knowledge or there's, no, there's nothing that has to be passed down to the next engineer taking over this project. So it's enabled him to just continue to grow and grow and grow and set us up to, I think, be better in the future in terms of how we produce woods. So we go, there's a story in terms of the product evolution itself. In fact, that there are pauses in time which become your latest launch. Then you've got K driving the whole thing. And then the backdrop is the proven ground, which is the tour. So it's safe to say that all of those components were part of the three-year time, the three-year plan when you set off. Yeah, to, to have one without any of the others, the plan doesn't work. So if we were to say we're going to continue to make the best woods, you know, we're going to have this three-year project, but then again, nobody plays it on tour, or you know, we're gonna have a tour strategy but all of a sudden we're delivering different product year after year. No, none of it works unless all of it is a plan together. So it took you know, a change of thinking and I'll, I'll never forget sitting in meetings in Japan in Osaka with a group of people trying to convince you know, a large group of 30 people who have been doing things one relatively consistent and you don't wanna say easy way, but been doing something very similar year after year after year to say, we want to scrap all this and start com something completely different. It takes a lot of convincing. It takes a lot of faith and trust in the entire team. And it takes full commitment and full buy-in from everybody involved as well. So should we go to the end of that story, which is we don't want to talk again too much sales numbers because that, that's not particularly interesting. 
However, I've, I've, again, I've noticed on a lot of the reviews, one of the kind of the prompts is these Mizuno drivers are really, really coming on. You probably don't own one yet. There's an assumption, there's a little bit of an assumption that there's not that many being sold, but I'm not, we're not going to go into sales data. But in the US alone, since 2018, you've doubled your driver sales. Yeah, almost tripled our driver sales. So right, okay. you know, if, you, if you start the number low, it makes it easy to triple. <laughs> but at the same time, you're right. It, it's a growing market and it's a growing trend for us. So you're, you're right. I'm, I think one of, the, uh, one of the biggest reviewers out there started it, started his whole review with, you've probably never hit this club and you probably won't. But at the same time, it, it speaks to where we've started. But I think that year after year, that's going to change. And that's, that's ultimately our goal is obviously our club, we're never going to be 100% market share, you know, or even 50% market share. That's not our goal. And our goal isn't to be market share driven, it's to be product driven. So what we've done and what we've established, this foundation has built us for growth and has built us for consumer trust and has built us for tour player trust, retailer trust, like you name it. All the different aspects are working. So the fact that we've tripled our driver share over the last couple of years, it's, it, it shows that the project is working and that the process is working. But you might not be able to fly under the radar that much longer. At some point, someone else is going to see those numbers and yeah. It's not making plans for us, I would guess. The, the driver world is the most cutthroat of any, you know, of any product category out there. It's the sexy one. It's the loudest one. And ultimately, we've tripled our share by still not being loud. I think you know, to, get, to get much beyond, you have to get louder and louder. And ultimately, Mizuno, a lot of times, has, has, relayed, has relied on the outside to be loud for us. You know, we're not the loudest marketing company. But as we continue to grow, we're hoping that that, that rumbling, that noise will come from external. And then we'll, we'll build a little bit internally as well. I know that's what you and we've, and we've got Matt on YouTube as well. Don't forget, Matt. <laughs> that's either going to be a very good thing or a very, really bad thing. So I apologize <laughs> again. So Matt, we're just, I'm sorry to leave you out of the conversation, but we're going a little bit technical. So chip, chip in when you feel comfortable when something rings a bell with you. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, I'm just going to play on with Chris for a little bit. Absolutely, yeah. That, that three-year plan again, Chris. So what the, one of the big changes, we go year one, ST190, SP700 face. So a step up from the, the kind of standard traditional 6.4 titanium. The biggest evolution in the product probably happened last year with the 200, which was the SAT 2041 Beta Ti. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, so so that's, you a found, that's a foundation that's carried on. You've seen a couple of things evolve. So, you know, we talk about the start being the 190. Before that, we, we did have an ST driver. We had an ST180. So the ST180, it featured a SP700 face. It was a fully titanium, uh, a fully titanium head. Evolving to the ST190, which is where this really started, was we, we evolved that SP700, which was an alpha beta titanium, which is gonna give a little bit more ball speed to, uh, to the face. But then we brought composite on. That was the, our change from a blue head to a black head, which I know certain of us on this call still are big fans of the blue head, which is okay. The blue is a beautiful thing, but I think black actually helps you a little bit in terms of just not giving a reason to dislike a Mizuno driver right off the bat. For, for, but, for, for a period of time, correct, Chris? For a period of time, exactly. Wait till we go all blue again. <laughs> no, but... but uh, I, just, I just heard uh, Matt groan in the corner. Oh. <laughs> not a fan of blue way, Matt. Uh, there, as Chris says, there, there's, I think there's the, the positives of having a clean black appearance at a dress it far outweighs the blue. I think it, it frames a golf ball a bit better more than anything. You know, coming, coming at it from a, a, a factual point of view, I think it frames a golf ball nicely. It instills a bit more confidence. I mean, I, yes, you could just say I didn't like the blue, but I think there's a little bit more to it than that. I do you think that the, the, the visuals of it currently uh, do make it sit a little bit better, a little bit uh, more. Especially uh, when we're trying to get people's trust on tour and that kind yeah. of higher level of player. Absolutely. You know, if we, if we continue on what we're doing and, you know, five, six years down the line, we're still producing great drivers year on year on year, then we'll have a blue conversation maybe. <laughs> we'll have, we'll have in, in the comments down below, tell Matt why he's wrong. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, what, what's funny is we're, for the longest time, we're the company with the most understated irons and we're known and respected for that. 
And then we said, here's the brightest color driver you can look at. So, so there's a little bit of a disconnect there, but anyway. So then, so, but SAT 2041, Chris, so that, that's the yes. foundation. So generation two, um, you push the limits a little bit more because in reality, I guess you have an understanding of the material year one, but you don't want to take it to the extreme because we don't want breakages. We don't want people bringing their drivers back. We don't want players out on tour finding out that three months in suddenly it's, it's just kind of gone past that conformity issue. Yeah. So with, from ST 190, which was a, which was a SP 700, which is an alpha beta or a beta rich titanium to the ST 200, we evolved to what's called an SAT, which stands for super alloy titanium sat 2041. 2041 is a very strong material, but it's also got a, a very low modulus, which is awesome because it allows that pace to flex a little bit more. So typically, Again, I talked about drivers being the, the loudest, most shouty category there is where people get all excited and are gonna tell you all about what's new and all about what's different. Last year with the, S, with the ST200, we were actually a little bit quiet about the new material. From the manufacturing side, from the research and development side, when you're using a brand new material, the first go around with it, you almost have to be a little bit conservative just because you, ha you haven't seen it in the real world, how it's going to play out over time, how the face might you know, get performance creep or how it might you know, show damage or durability or something like that. So while R&D will always push the manufacturing and the production side to go very, very thin, we always get a little bit of a pushback with a brand new material. So uh, SAT 2041 on the ST200 was a little bit thicker than we thought we could be. And we kind of proved that out over the last year. So with the new one with the STZ and the STX, it's using the same material, which is that SAT 2041, but we actually thinned out strategically certain areas and we evolved the, the head shape itself in terms of how it's welded, where it's welded and dialed in something that we knew could get even hotter. So we could get more ball speed out of the same material. So we knew we were going to get an initial jump on the 200 and then we took it a step further with this new, with this new face. The material then, Chris, tell me what it means to, the, to a normal person, to a normal golfer or to a tour player what does this material mean to them? Because everyone takes everything to the, the legal limit now. So if we're all at the legal limit, how does having a better material help? Yeah, the, the exciting thing about this beta titanium, this SAT 2041, is a couple of the material properties of it. It's got a very high tensile strength and it's got a low modulus. So again, things that don't mean too much to the consumer or even to the retailer until you understand why those things are important. What's important about that is it allows us to have some extreme geometry changes in terms of the actual face part itself. So we can get a very aggressive, what we call our core tech multiple face thickness. So we can thin out strategic areas and we can make sure we're gonna get very consistent high ball speeds all across the face. What it's really going to mean down the line and to the tour player and you know, as, we man as we dial in our manufacturing tolerances and our, our specs is because of its high tensile strength, we know that this material isn't going to necessarily age over time. It's not going to weaken, it's not going to crack. So what that means is you can actually set your initial target even closer to the legal limit because most products or most materials out there, when they start at call it you know 240 CT, as that product ages over the last over the next couple of years, it gets a little bit weaker. It gets a little bit weaker, and ultimately, that's why you've seen some players, you know, get dinged on the USGA RNA testing for clubs over the limit. So, by using this new material, we know that we can dial it very close to that limit and know it's going to stay right there. Which means best ball speed right out of the package, and also that ball speed continues. Matt, that's an interesting one for me. Is the performance creep issue? So do, do you have, do players like that out on tour? I mean, for the, for, the, for the normal golfer, we don't want that because eventually it ends with breakage, but which means we've got to buy another driver. But for a tour player who's not paying for the product, do, do they go looking for drivers with a little creep on them or, or is that a no-no? Well, I mean, I, I've, I've actually known, uh, known guys from, from other brands or, or known other players that deliberately will choose a slightly slower CT in the knowledge that it probably won't crack you know that, that sounds really stupid but you know they'll be going right okay we know that's 
So no, that's not right on the limit. And it's not going to be, you know, when you're hitting drivers every week out of the range, there is that that kind of um, just at the back of your mind, you're thinking, shoot, I, I, I'm quite attached to this driver. I hope this doesn't, you know, I hope anything, it doesn't crack or anything that's, that's going on with it. So yeah, it is in people's minds, but um, you know, I think with the, with the on-site testing they do at the open, and I think they're going to probably bring in some more kind of um, uh, laws, if you like, to kind of keep everything at the right side of, of correct. Yeah. I think that the, um, the less chances of breakage uh, for everyone is a positive just because you don't have to then dial in a new head. You don't have to reweight a new head. You don't have to worry about, you know, falling back in love with it. The, 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 the more longevity you can have with any club in your bag. I mean, look, as we were saying about the MP5 still being a great club, however long down the line, if, if there is no chance of, um, Oh, hang on. Sorry. Am I back in the room? You're back, back, Matt. You're back. back. You're fine. Sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah. If there's no chance of, of breakage, then yeah, you're on sure winner all round. Uh, we talked about the field, so we won't go back there. Uh, we don't need to talk about campaigns. I just had a little, we were talking through for the trade as well, Chris, that the, where, where the Showtime headline came from. So that was actually a play on the S and the T out of the product name, wasn't it? But also uh, th this kind of idea that most people now are not going to buy a driver purely on the advert, the print, the promise. The majority of people are buying on data now, Chris. Very few people are going to spend 300, 400 pound on a driver unless they've taken it in and given it a pretty thorough test against some competition. So actually, we are at a point now, which is kind of advantageous to Mizuno in particular, that the weight of advertising is possibly less important than it was a few years ago, hence the showtime, you know, less about the words, more about the product performance. Yeah, it's... You know, there were years and years and years where, you know, the sound was the most important thing because the sound was your only perception of how far the ball was going. And, and there were some loud drivers in that era. There were absolutely loud drivers in that era just for that reason. And even, you know, as silly as it sounds, even in certain shops, like mats that you're hitting the ball into would have a loud pop when the ball hit into it because that's the perception of how far is that ball going. The world has become so data-driven now with, launch monitors everywhere, simulators everywhere, and just data at your fingertips that now you can't hide behind the, the you know, the smoke of I, this is the loudest one, so it must be going the farthest. So now a little bit of the marketing has be, been put to the side because if it, that marketing doesn't mean anything if the data doesn't work. So that is to Mizuno's advantage to a, to some extent because we are we've never been the loudest not in terms of the driver sound but the loudest in terms of marketing marketing scream to the industry so now that we um we know that our product performs now it just becomes a take it to the simulator let it go put it up against anybody we feel like it's time for it to shine so you know the showtime you know tagline it means more than just trying to be a flashy buzzword or something. It literally is referring to, you know, the showtime is when it's on that launch monitor, when it's being compared to everybody else and it's going to win, it's going to perform. So put it up against anybody. And that's where, that's, will be dry. Sorry, Matt. So I was just going to say from my point of view, from, from where we come at it is we've had that feeling for so long with the irons, you know, and, and, whether you walk up and down the range and you've got that kind of uh, that reassurance of that to then bring that into the wood side of stuff with 190, 200 and now into what we're in the, the, the Z and the X again, that relationship building and that trust is only going to go one way. So you can't hide behind anything. You can't baffle people with, uh, with jib jab and, and try and get it in their ear that, Oh yeah, that, that's much better. Like you used to be able to. So to have, um, to have the relationship going one way, but also the product coming with you, those two are just two things that, that in today's world, whether it be out on tour or whether it be in retail, if you haven't got both those things, then you know, you're up against it now, I think. So we, we, we managed to introduce the tagline there, Chris, and not make it about marketing. We've kind of, I think we've argued against ourselves to some degree, but it's, um, <laughs> there, there, there's, some, there's, some, there's, there's some truth in it and there's some good intent behind that line. Um, then you're going to come up, we're going to come up against some competition that are going to say this is the driver's lo the longest driver ever, the fastest ball speed ever, this one's 20 yards longer than it used to be. 
we don't like going down that tack particularly, and we're not. I don't. I don't believe we go into on this one either. So, what's the Mizuno claim then? In amongst Showtime and the new face material, what 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 can we claim that's that's viable that makes sense? It, it's it's funny how everybody goes for the, the the big numbers of how far it's going to go. You know, if you're if you're comparing this and getting dialed in, getting fit compared to a driver that's not fit to you. I, it wouldn't be rare to see someone gain 20 yards. However, in the modern world where a lot of drivers are close to legal limits and there's a lot of high tech materials going into everything and, and a lot, most drivers probably now are fit. So with that being said, the thing with ours with the STZ and the STX is they're each designed to do something a little bit different. So each one is designed to fit a specific swing type and fit a specific type of player. So with that, we know that we can get a player dialed in to one of these two heads. You know, oftentimes it could be that it's, it's very close between them because we can dial in very specific head uh, launch parameters with both of them. So it's all about now having options and having fitting capabilities. And I know that makes the retailer side easier. It makes it better for the consumer because all of a sudden they have options. They know that, you know, if, if this doesn't work right here, I can make it work. And it makes the tour side and for Matt's side, it's got to really open up a ton of doors. So maybe not, we're not going to shout the world's longest driver, but it'd be fair to say, Matt, if you put it up against some that are claimed to be the world's longest driver, they're comparable, and for, for many people, they are going to be longer. So it's is an also, claim, but yeah, I, I think there's more. There's, there's there is a bunch more to a driver than just being able to hit it, you know, as as physically long as possible. There has to be more to it. You know, you, you have to have the that massive element, and I would probably argue now forgiveness is a little bit more important than than overall distance in in today's world because you know with golf ball technology, with shaft technology. Everything is kind of is is working as hard as it can to um, to give you distance, but if we can find a way of taming distance and finding something that you're going to hit much more fairways with, I I would and that comes down to the fitter, you know, and, and who you're talking to and who you trust in your golf to to give you an accurate description of what what's going to suit your game more you know don't get me wrong if you're if you're an aging gentleman and you you know you're struggling to make carries then you're in a different ballpark to uh danny who plays off one who's 21 years old and you're going to require different things but as chris says now we've got option to look after both then you can again just you can you can kill so many different birds with with well two stones <laughs> So I'm I just have, popping up another one of the slides, Chris. So we're, we're now into the X and the Z. We're into the physical product now. Um, equal partners this time around. I'm just going to flick through a few photos and we'll, we'll, we'll cut those into the screen. So the X this time I, equally is important, correct? Yeah, it's, it's interesting now where last generation, the STX was designed to do one very specific thing. The SDG was designed to do one very different thing, the 200G, and the, the ST200 was the, the one that was basically for everybody. So we had two or three clubs where one of them spoke to 80%, and then the other two spoke to the, the fringes, those other 10. Now the Z and the X are designed to be on equal footing. They're designed to be which which type of weighting and which type of head release and head stability works for you. So it's, it's a rethinking of how do you make, you know, again, it's, it's now two heads versus three, but those two heads are going to do more than those three heads did in terms of being able to, to dial more people in. When we showed you the first time, Matt, the two heads, you were surprised at how different they looked compared to the previous generations. I know some people since have said they look quite similar. But in your eye, you took your, you saw two slightly different shapes, didn't you? Yeah, which which straight off the deck that was that was quite exciting because although under the hood the the two hundred and the G were very different, they did they they kind of looked almost identical behind the golf ball. You know, their appearance at address was identical. So to be able to put the Z and the X straight down behind the golf ball and and know straight away that they were two very different footprints was I thought that was great you know I love that because it gives you it gives you like visual visuals are so so important with anything to do with golf but especially with driver when you can clearly see what something's designed to do because if you have got a screamingly bad shot and you know you've got that bad shot to put something down that kind of cures that 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 um 
that bit of fear, you know, when you're on the tee, that again, that's a great thing to have. Likewise, when you've got, um, if, you, if you're if you missing it left or right and you've got something that sits and gives you that confidence at address, then instantly you're in, you know, you've got your foot in the door because then, then, then that starts a conversation that is only going to flow into, you know, 10 different things that we can discuss thereafter. So I'm looking at the photo, Chris, where you've got the two heads side by side. So I'm looking mm-hmm. at the crown view and I'm looking at the face view. So wh- how would you describe the shape difference between Z and X? So between the two heads, they're two heads designed with different weighting, but we wanted each view to tell you exactly what it's going to do. And that's kind of what each of these heads does. So in terms of the the toe view and the face view, the STZ, which is more designed for the straight line flight, you know, deep center of gravity, very stable, everything speaks to that. It's a shallower head in terms of the face height. It's a little bit deeper from front to back. It's a little bit longer from toe to heel. All things that are going to encourage that higher moment of inertia, that straighter ball flight, that more straight line flight. The STX on the other hand, where the weighting is designed with the mass more pulled towards the hosel, a little bit shorter center gravity to shaft axis. Everything about that head speaks to that as well the head shape, it's taller. The face itself is a deeper face. It's shorter from toe to heel, which moves that center of gravity ever so slightly towards the heel. It's shorter from front to back, which again, encourages that ball flight to actually turn a little bit more from right to left. So again, it's pulling every lever available to make sure that club is going to do exactly what it's designed to. I'm gonna go back and look at the address position as well. So. I, I, I can I can see a little bit there at address. I can definitely see that on the Z, the back pulled out. And the interesting thing is the, the original intent is that the, the X is known as the draw the draw bias driver. So is the shape because it's draw biased, or was that was there more intent in that? Because I know to Matt's eye, it immediately looked like a better player product because it had that little bit of extra depth to it. Yeah, an interesting thing is if you look at a lot of competitors and a lot of you know tour history of drivers you'll see a lot of 460 cc drivers on the market and then many companies will create a slightly smaller a 440 or a 420 cc that typically is a deeper face design it's a little bit shorter from toe to heel and actually our x resembles that very much and that's why i know matt right off the bat said to to his eye as a better player it immediately jumped to his eye the reason that that works for a lot of players is not necessarily because that better player wants to hook the ball What it does is it moves the center of gravity closer to the shaft axis and the moment of inertia about the shaft axis, essentially how fast that toe wants to close down is a little bit lower. And what that does is it puts the player more in control. So in the same way a blade is the most workable type of iron because it has the shortest CG to shaft axis, actually an X axis design is a more workable driver as well. When you bring that center of gravity closer, it allows a player to actually hit a cut easier. So while the Z, the head is a little bit more in control because it's ultra stable, it's got a longer CG to shaft axis. The X, yes, if you release it through, you're able to turn it over easier. But if you're a player who likes to be able to work the ball and likes to put a little bit of control behind it, you can do that easier with the X. Matt, have you still got the X? Because you initially leaned that way, didn't you? I did, yeah. I, I've got, I've settled on the Z just because when we when we previously did that, you went back. You you went back on your first instinct. <laughs> yeah. So that but but that that first, um, I mean, that was a pure um, just grab what suits your eye to start with, and that again, as as Chris says, I did I, I gravitated towards the X purely because I put it down. I went more than anything. I went. That's really intriguing because it's different to the two hundred. You know, both the two hundred and the G, and I thought that's got a lot of positives for me that I instantly liked um but since then obviously had some little more time to hit both and and have settled on one that I really, really really like but um finding the one that suits your eye perhaps isn't always the one that that, that suits your 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 ball flight characteristics and 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 the x didn't I preferred the 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 kind of more neutral uh, z but yeah, that's just a prime example of something that, that you, you think might look right, but then dynamically then becomes something slightly different. So again, you've got to you've got to fall in love with the looks of it, but you've also got to go and hit it and try it and you know d- see different things. So yeah, they're, they're both as important as each other, I think. Do you have the samples there, Chris, in fr- within arm's reach? Nope. 
Sorry. Uh, this is where, like, <laughs> this is where the, the wrong person has the clubs. I should have come to feel like I need to somehow pass it through the screen for you. But we've got we've got the photos up there. But I said the, the, the other thing I don't know if we, that doesn't get talked about a lot. I don't know if that comes through there is that that crown, uh, mm -hmm. the, the paint lines and stuff, which is a really, really different look, isn't it? Yeah, it's it's it is, is a that, much is, that, is that visible there? Or am I just turning clubs for no particular reason? <laughs> it's visible. <laughs> okay, good. There is a there is a much larger um, composite crown than it was on the previous version. So that that window is expanded, which allowed us to save more mass, which redistributed around to either pull back in the Z or keelward on the X. But the way we mask it is different as well. So it's a little bit of a different look across the front line in terms of how we we put to square it up at a dress. I know that some of the pictures that you have, you can see that, but across the, the tail end, across the skirt as well, you can see it's the transition is different than it was before. All of these just showing where we save mass and how we redistribute it around to weight it, particularly how we wanted to. I'm going to go, I'm just going to show the two slides on the Z axis and the, and the Z axis, because that's where the naming of the product came from, is where you move the weight relative to those two axes. So yes. Z, weight away from the face and X kind of weight moving more into the heel. Is that right? Yeah, the typical 3D, the, the origin or the, the axes set up when we're designing something in 3D is in the, the toe heel direction is X, up down direction is Y and straight back is the Z. So, you know, if you want to talk about where is the, the origin or the, the center of all these axes is typically right on the sweet spot. So that's, that's the, the basis of what everything is designed around is that sweet spot. So with the STZ, what we wanted to do and what we were able to execute is pull a ton of mass directly back very symmetrically across that Z axis. We didn't want that weight to be pulled towards the toe, towards the heel. We wanted everything to be ultra stable and designed to be low and deep along that Z. So that's gonna give us a low sweet spot. It's gonna give us ease of launch and it's gonna give us a head that doesn't want to twist. It's a head that wants to stay stable. So that's designed for that straight line ball flight, which is the STZ, very stable. Again, more things done in terms of from the sole view as well. All the mass, the composite that was removed from the sole side was done symmetrically from the toe and the heel. So you can concentrate that mass low and deep across that Z axis. And then when you flip over to the X, you know, I talked about the X axis being in the toe heel direction. What we wanted, what we did is we moved the mass down that X axis. So closer towards the hosel. So a couple of things happened to do that. First off, I talked about the head shape being different. The deeper face, the shorter from toe to heel, shorter from front to back, all of those things move that center of gravity towards that hosel. In addition, the hosel itself is actually slightly inboarded, so pushed a little bit more towards that center to minimize that distance and minimize that CG to shaft axis. But then when you look at it from the sole side, rather than removing composite from the toe and the heel, we just removed composite from the toe side. So you can see the window actually expanded. So a large amount of mass removed from there and then concentrated on the heel. So rather than removing uh, composite or removing titanium or replacing it with composite, you actually have additional titanium on the heel side. And then the weight screw itself on the Z is directly down the center. On the X, it's pulled towards the heel. All things to encourage that short CG to shaft axis. So the weight all kind of mass down there in the heel. So we've got that, that kind of denser effect there, the weight screw plus the titanium up in the toe. And then on the Z, nice and kind of equal, really, really balanced. Yep. Matt, any, anything to add to that in terms of testing and stuff? Is that all really... Is it noticeable when you're hitting balls with players? When you haven't done a lot of testing with with them side by side, but in the testing you have done, is it is it really noticeable difference in ball flight? Yeah, yeah, and I think it gives you that extra bit of that, that extra piece in your armory to to be able to look after a tendency. You know, try and try to look after a tendency, but also then gives you um, uh, with shaft and obviously all the other variables that go with it but it gives you two very, very different options, which I think personally for me, when I saw that, I thought that was great because the more option you have, um, the more kind of more golfers you're going to be able to look after and the more golfers that you'll be able to maximize distance and forgiveness. And, and to have the, the two doing different things, um, that was a real, real plus point for me. I thought that was a really nice, really nice move. And then the, the other slide I've just popped up, Chris, is the difference between the, the STX gives you a couple of different options. So the original 200X, 
was really an older man, slower swing speed, big draw bias driver, lightweight shaft was the M Fusion 39 gram shaft in there, playing at 45 and three quarter length, I think. Mm -hmm. This time round, you've got a factory preset weight. So you've got a choice between the 11 gram back weight and the four gram back weight, which the consumer, the golfer doesn't need to worry about. But if you you can order it with a, with the with the normal shaft as well, Chris. So a normal forty five inch shaft, normal weight in, and that will naturally come with the blue weight, the eleven gram. Yeah, it's funny how a product evolves from where it started. Where the ST one, excuse me, the ST two hundred X, it was a very lightweight head, and you know that's that's what's necessary when you're designing for a Japan spec for a long length, whippy shaft, light grip. You know, it was a it was a head weight that was a good. 10 grams lighter than the standard one. However, with the new design, because we wanted to make this more prone to be played by a better player who might want to be able to turn it over or just work the ball a little bit more, we saw the opportunity to make this not just the, the lightweight design. We saw the opportunity to make this one that you could factory order in different head weights. And that allows you to play it in either the J-Spec, which is the original uh, lightweight head, or put the weight, the heavier weight, which exists in the STZ, and put that in the STX to design for a more standard head weight. So that allows it to be played by someone who doesn't necessarily need those lightweight components, who doesn't need that longer length. And if you want to put it at a standard 45 inch, which all of Mizuno's are other than our J-Spec, it allows you to build it like that. So there's really no compromise from the custom fit side. And story-wise, a lot of that came from the tour, didn't it? Because we found ourselves on the workshops with the 200X. We had, we weighted a few very differently so you could go for the 45-inch shaft, right? So it came from a real-world scenario where a tour player came to us and actually preferred the look of the X, wanted the draw fly. So we're weighting things differently. But the golfer, the, the, the amateur, couldn't get that from us. Yeah, it's funny that, that where the X started and why, even with the ST200, we saw some tour players actually go to the ST200X. The reason for that is because this ST200 and the STZ, for that matter, isn't necessarily a workable head. So it's a head that's designed to be so stable and so straight hitting that some of the feedback from, uh, from multiple players was, I struggle to get this thing to turn over, to get this to move from right to left. And a lot of that is because everything was designed around that Z axis design. So with the ST 200 X, we actually saw a few players who said, well, let me take this lightweight head and just manipulate this to work for a tour player and a head that, you know, to the consumer was only available in a 39 gram ultra light whippy shaft. There were players playing it on tour with X flex shafts and heavy weights and all this because it gave you that ability to turn the ball over and make it more workable. So that's where all of this came from is it was a, almost a tour first, I wouldn't say discovery, but something that we saw the trend on tour of ultra stability isn't necessarily for everybody. And Dave, I can't remember where we were. Where were we? We would have been, uh, we, were, we were in a meeting one and, and, we were talking to everyone and everyone said, oh, you're okay. So this is like your, your kind of your higher handicap club. And I remember saying, hang on. I said, I wouldn't give it that label just yet because if it weighted correctly or, or weighted differently to how it could be, this could be a driver used on tour. I think we were in La Cala, Dave, maybe. Yeah, um, possibly. I, remember, I remember saying, you know, this, it, 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 just because it is of, um, in that world doesn't necessarily mean that that's where it belongs. People so. like to pigeonhole clubs though, don't they, very early on. Yeah. And it's a, it's a dangerous thing to do, isn't it? You know, Absolutely. somebody like yourself who gets the opportunity to see people hit and do more lengthy testing with stuff, you, you, you see you see the truth of the products over a period of time. For, for the consumer, Chris, I think in America, you've actually called this the J-Spec. So if somebody asks for the J-Spec, actually what you're asking for is the M-Fusion shaft. Have I got that right? That's correct. Yeah. If somebody were to go in the custom world and order this or, or on the retail rack, the J spec is what we call the lightweight, uh, lightweight head at 45 and three quarters with an M fusion shaft. Outside of that, it's not really the J spec outside of that. The STX is designed to be built just like everything else with our 45 inches with a full array of shafts, high launch, mid launch, low launch, a ton of different custom options with a, with a heavier head weight. And I say heavier, heavier relative to the J spec with a neutral standard head weight. So that gives us, if I'm not mistaken, that gives six possibilities because the, the STZ is available in two lofts, nine, five, 10, five, the X, 
10, 5, and a 12, but also potentially as a J spec. So there's actually six options there between those two different heads. But the biggest question we get asked at this point is where's the G gone? So mm -hmm. is there no need for a G anymore? Have we got our low spin one with the STZ? So the, the G was interesting because we actually saw a lot of players use the G how we're using the X now. So it, it's interesting. If you look at a player like Luke Donalds playing the G and he played it with some of the weight pulled towards the heel. We saw some other players use it with the weight pulled towards the heel and ultimately working that, getting that workability out of the G. So to say that the G is gone, I wouldn't say you've seen the last of the G from us. There, there may be some, some additional weight variable options from us coming in the future, but we feel like with these two heads, with these different weighting options, we're able to fit everybody we were able to fit before. So the STZ itself, you're able to get a very low spin character out of that as well, because with that Z axis design, we actually lower the sweet spot even lower than we were before. If somebody is, there's a few players out there that want ridiculously low spinning drivers, is G still the place to go if you're like in that absolute end of the bell curve in that 0.01% guy who needs yeah. to not spin right down? There's still a G for now though. You'd still there is recommend still they look at the 200G. Yeah, so we, we've continued on with the ST200G for that someone who needs that just ridiculously, ridiculously low, spin. low spin rate. Right. And I, I was talking to somebody uh, yesterday who was a G player and they, but they play the G with the weight all the way back. Now they had the 190 G with the weight all the way forwards. But yep. I remember even working with Luke, the spin comparable 190 to 200 was Luke played weights forward, I believe in the 190 and then back a bit with the G and ended up with a similar spin number. That 200 G is a ridiculously low spin head, correct? You're exactly right. Uh, that G, when you put the weight back, it was, I'd say the weight all the way back in the G is still even slightly lower spin than the than the new S, uh, Z and X. So it's a ridiculously low spin head. So the players who need it, like with that weight all the way forward, we're talking players with crazy high ball speed or, you know, very negative angles of attack who impart a ton of spin. That's our real spin killer, and it continues in the line. But there's not many people like that. There's not. And I, I, it's well, and what somebody has to understand if they're opting for the G to get a low spin rate that low, there's there's a sacrifice there because ultimately, when a spin rate that low means a low sweet spot and also means a very forward center of gravity, where the, the STZ is designed for that low center of gravity, low and deep center of gravity. So to to get that lowest spin you're going to sacrifice moment of inertia. So the club's not going to be as stable. You're not going to have as consistent of ball speeds on miss hits. So by all means, fit into it if you need it, but understand that there are some sacrifices being made when you do that. And then just in the product roundup, always the, the product that kind of gets less to the end of the conversation, but actually for us has made the most noise potentially in this launch has been the three wood. So we've had the guys over at TXG. So the guys at TXG obviously do, do a fantastic job. I always think they're a really good source of information for people looking for product, proper pro, proper test data, because mm -hmm. although they're YouTubers, they're fitters first, right? So they're fitters with a YouTube channel as opposed to YouTubers on the basis of entertainment. And there's a place for both. And that both sets of opinions are completely valid because we end up playing golf on our own out in the course. So the entertainment side is also valid, but the guys at TXG, 100% data, 100% performance, they can measure probably like nobody else, nobody else out there can measure, maybe with the exception of Ask Golf Nut, Jay Smith, who also does a great job on that side. But the three wood came out testing really, really strong for Matt, and that seems to have gone relatively viral and made, made quite a lot of noise out there. Yeah, in... They, and they pointed out exactly what it does different than most of the three woods in the industry, which I think is something that people should really take note of. While the world of drivers has obviously become very low spin, uh, you know, all about ball speed, all about distance, the world of three woods has followed suit to some level to the point where three woods aren't playable for a lot of players in terms of what they're intended to do which you know obviously you, you'll 
you take a three wood to be more of a control club off the tee when you don't want to hit a driver, or you're taking a three wood to, to control one into a fairway or control one into a green or something like that to where if you're spinning a three wood at 2200, 1900, something like that, you're going to struggle for it to lift. You're going to struggle for it to carry, and you're going to struggle for it to hold anything. So with the STZ, and again, Z because of the Z-axis design, more mass, low and deep along that very neutral Z-axis, it's designed to launch higher. It's designed to not be high spin, but not be ridiculously low spin. And I think that's what has been discovered. And that's what has been pointed out where it's different than the industry, is you're getting speed, you're getting launch, and you're getting controllable spin rates out of a three. I noticed on Matt's numbers that the the ball speed was really good it was the highest of the ones they tested but like you said it actually wasn't the longest because they turned it into landing angle they turned it into control mm -hmm. and that's what as a really strong player that's what he liked about it well and, I, and i'm sure that's something you deal with matt on the tour all the time yeah yeah the 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 question i always start with is what job do you want your three wood to do do you want it to be a rocket driver backup or do you want it to be a three wood because they're two different clubs and and as you say i, I certainly the last few and it's, it's not just us. Every, everyone's kind of following suit from having these rocket ship drivers and a rocket ship three. And you say, well, it, it kind of doesn't, the cuffs and collars don't match. You know, it's not doing what it's designed to do. You know, it, when do you hit three wood or when do you want to hit three? Do you want to hit it off a, off, a, off a tight par four, perhaps? Do you want to hit it into a par five? And the last thing you want to do is, is it coming out at head height, scaring every worm, you know? You still want to be able to get something that's, that's forgiving, going to launch and going to stop the other end, you know, and that's, that's sometimes it's been, uh, that has been, um, a little bit overlooked. Yeah. And I think that's where, I mean, I love the, the new three wood is super sexy looking and is, yeah, I mean, it ticks a lot of boxes. I think it is a really great club. Yeah. Spend a lot of time on the shape as well though, Chris, didn't you? Cause I know that it's this area here, right? This is the, this is the key area. Have we got that right? There and how the hosel transitions into that leading edge. That's something that we really took a good look at in terms of making it very, very smooth and very seamless in terms of how it exits that hosel and goes into that leading edge. Because ultimately when it sits down behind the ball, the three wood has a lot of different jobs off the tee, off the turf. And you know, if, if you see kind of some strange angles in there, it, it's going to manipulate how you come into the ball or how you release through it. So by really dialing in that shape, it gives a lot of more confidence to a lot of better players. Mm. And it's, a, it's a club that like the tour players, you'll, you'll often find an old three wood in the bag. It can often be the oldest club in the bag. Yeah, you're right. That's a club that when, when players have a three wood that they like, it, it's tough to mess with it because, you know, as Matt said, what does your three wood do? And if somebody knows what it does, it's tricky to start tweaking that. Mm. Because normally, I think normally you, you'll, you'll go to your three wood if there's something bothering you with the tee shot, for instance, or something is, is creeping into play that you perhaps are fearful of. So th to have a three wood that you, you put down behind the golf ball and you go, right, this is going to get up or this is going to fly. You know, you need to have that kind of that positive um, reassurance in your own it's mind. A it's a do. comfort club in many ways. It isn't is. it? Absolutely. Totally. Yeah. And, and I was, I was always a bit cautious of having a three wood that went too far because then it then it's not doing what it's designed to do. You know, you've got X amount of clubs in your bag and they need to do different things to warrant their place in the bag. And too many people, I think, how often did you hear people saying, oh, you know, I, I when I hit my three-wood well, I hit it almost as far as my driver. And you go, well, is that a good thing? You know, hang on, right. like, let's let's actually put that into context of, of, of creating a set of golf clubs or, or, or building a bag that um, that is individual clubs you've got two there that are coming out one's perhaps flying a little different but they're ending up at the same spot and you say well do you need both perhaps not you know and that's where you need to kind of really be critical of each club that it does what you want it to do i love looking there was at a moment sorry Matt, chris there was, i just wanted to remind you of a story there was a moment when we were with keith last year keith mitchell and you were looking at three was with him and couldn't quite get it right and actually the favourite one he pulled out, his favourite Mizuno that he'd actually bought, I think, when he was at uni, was an old F60. Yep. And, that yeah. was all that, and the only thing he wanted to talk about was how it looked and how it sat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it was all about the head shape. And what that club did was some different things than what the modern three wood has started to do. So that it was a deeper face design. Um, it had a really nice transition. It looked... 
that club looked behind the ball off the turf like you could do it whatever you wanted with it and i think there's a level of confidence behind that and i, I was going to say i think there's one thing that i always like to look at is trends of the tour players because i think you can learn a lot about what a club does by what's in the tour players bags and what i mean by that is the modern three wood has gotten to be so low spin that if you look at a lot of players, some of the really fast swinging players out there, you're seeing a lot of four woods and seven woods in play and actually fewer three woods. You know, it, I, seven wood used to be a golf club that was only for the highest of handicaps. And now you're seeing top 10 players in the world who drive at 330 yards playing seven woods. The reason is, the low spin of the modern three wood means that it's not coming in. It's not landing. It's not being a control club. And they're actually having to add loft to get it to do what it was supposed to do. So that's where I think our three wood is what a three wood is meant to do. So that's, that's something where don't be fooled by what went the longest on a launch monitor. Understand that a three wood is designed for a specific purpose. It's designed to be more of a control club. And I, uh, I, that, that really hit home to me when I, work, when I first started working with, with guys out on tour is this club needs to go this far, you know, and that's, that's mm -hmm. always the way it should be. It should say, right, you know, I've got a 260-yard a, a gap in my bag and I need something to fill that. And, I, and I'm, if that's three wood or five wood, however you go about it, but work that way, you know, you work forward or, or from – yard is yeah. back to the club as opposed to just going oh well i hit my three with 300 yards and i hit my driver 302 yards you know right. there definitely is a a way of working it out and and again comes down to being fit being able to hit it and say right that that suits the window i want to hit it in and bang it in the bag <laughs> and then one more conversation on that chris so th this this comes as a, a three wood and a five wood both adjustable so, so I'm, I'm just going to go to a couple of questions in a minute but one of them i yeah. remember seeing earlier was if you want a forward, do you, do you loft up the three or do you loft down the five? So, yeah, if, if you're a player who's looking for a forward, let's say you're looking for 16 degrees, you have yeah. two options. You could take a 15 degree three wood and shut it down a degree. So, you know, that is going to give you a face angle that's pointing a little bit more left, which a lot of players that that's a no go. That's a deal breaker on a three wood. So actually probably the more typical thing for someone looking for a four would be to open up a five wood and that's going to deal off that. So you could take that 18 degree and open it up too. So that's going to give you that more, open look it's going to you know take that left out of play but if you're someone who wants it you know who doesn't mind being able to turn it over then you take it the other way but that's the great thing is now by having adjustability in both of them you've got two options what have you got in the bag chris three wood five wood four wood what's in yours i have a three wood and a five wood so i i was someone you know matt talks about looking for a distance uh, I've always been someone who carried a, a driver, a three wood. And then for the longest time I had a 19 degree hybrid, but then, you know, basically my three wood was very low spin. I had an older one that was opened up and it was, it was a not good hitting off the turf club. It was a good hitting off a T club. Um, as our three woods have, I mean, really gotten great over the last couple of years, I went into a three wood that now carries great and launches good off the turf. But what I found is I needed a 230 yard carry. That was the, the distance I was missing. So, you know, the three wood's going to come in too hot. It's going to carry a little bit further than that. And the hybrid was carrying, call it 220. And I wasn't quite getting that. So I actually added a five wood, which, you know, I was of that, way of thinking that a five woods is a is a high handicapper club like i was always against a five wood for the longest time and now it's become one of my favorite clubs it's so easy to hit and it's very consistent and it lands how it should so it's a fly 330 and it'll only release to about like 335 or something so it, it's a very controllable golf club matt what have you got now are you three wood five wood or just one i've gone drive i've got driver three wood uh, and then two hybrid um but again i like to i like to use i don't often where i play my golf i don't often need to hit three wood off the turf that much so i quite like to have it as something i can i can there's a few tee shots that i'm not particularly keen of that i can just poke a little three wood down and it, it it sits in my bag perfectly um and just a finishing point chris shafts so i know in, in the u.s there are some upcharge options as well 
Uh, but actually, in the one of the great things about the Mizuno Woods at the moment is the range of custom shafts that come without upcharge. So mm. give me an example of a few things that have been added to the mix this time around. Yeah, so we have a ton of shaft options this time. We've got a high launch, mid launch, low launch that you'll see on the rack with these woods. So our high launch being a Riptide CV, which is a really nice high launching, slightly higher spinning shaft. Our mid launch being the Matori XF3, very solid, very stable, call it mid, mid shaft. And then for a low launch, it's the hazardous smoke RDX black. So, you know, it's a firm tip, low launching, lower spinning. All three of those available in lots of different weights, lots of different flexes. But again, those are just additions to our lineup. You know, we can carry on with the Diamante line, the red, white, the blue, the Atmos, Atmos Tour Spec, uh, some of the Tense CK product, just a load of different options, all available at no upcharge, just so you can get dialed in a fitting software that will help dial you in that. Matt, anything on those shafts? Anything there interesting for you? Anything you like particularly that people might be impressed by the world of shafts is is always evolving and it's always impressive and it's always aiding what we're doing with our heads so there's there's the reoccurring theme here is option you know have an option to be able to go to your fitters go to your guys and say right you know this is what i want and to have the option there that, that was the most frustrating thing i think when you've got a very good um uh fairway wood or driver and it works well for some people, but they just don't have the option for that other person to have option. It, it just completes the range so much and it makes everything much more, much and, easier. And you, you were saying earlier, like, don't just do this from the perspective as I played that last time, I'll just throw the head on the old shaft. Yeah. Look totally. at it as a moving piece. Yeah. Cause different heads, you know, react differently to different, um, uh, different shafts and, and, and change is, is sometimes quite nice. So to have some different option and, and to kind of, dial in a new driver every now and again you know if it's been a year or two years since you bought a driver your goals probably changed a little bit so yeah always explore the idea of, of of starting from fresh and and seeing what seeing what gains can be can be made chris i'm just going to read you a couple of manageable questions that you haven't already covered uh do mizuno plan to make weights adjustable for home club builders in the future maybe oh, we're going to let people tinker that way yeah, maybe eventually in the future we might get there. there. There's some tricky things when you're talking about weight, especially as you're putting heavier weights in products. You know, for example, the STZ has an 11 gram stainless steel weight that's screwed into the back. A lot of times what we want to do is make sure that that's going to stay and it's not going to move. The more mass you concentrate in a smaller area, it's a, it's a large area of amplitude. So it'll vibrate more than a typical, if you put a lighter weight in that area. So as the weights get heavier and heavier, they become prone to get loose. So as a result of that, we actually lock tight those within our factory. So that's why we say these are custom built and custom assembled with the, with the heavier weights in them. So as of right now, we don't encourage uh, home tinkering just because of that, because we don't want that weight to come loose on you. And then you've sort of covered this, but with the limitations in place, 460cc, COR, how challenging did you find it producing a product that gets better than the previous model? Obviously, R&D's hands are tied in terms of some levers that you can pull in a design. We're going to be locked in COR. We're going to be locked in, uh, in head size. You know, we're locked in length now. Arguably, we might be locked at a different length coming up in the future. We don't know that. But ultimately, there's plenty of fitting things and plenty of consistency things that we're, where we're not locked. So that's where you see a lot of uh, effort being put into consistent ball speeds, repeatability, custom options, different options between different heads, and just the ability to get more easily dialed into your specs. So... Yes, it's a challenge because you can't do, you, we can't make a ball speed that's going to go 10 miles an hour faster because we wouldn't be allowed to do that. But we can make a ball that will go faster on the toe than it used to go on the toe and more, more similar on the toe than it used to go in the middle. So, it, you know, there's, there's options there and we're going to continue to evolve that just to make sure that, you know, the ultimate goal of a fitting is if the center ball strike is perfect, you want every strike from there to be as close to those perfect launch parameters as possible. And that's what we're striving towards. Which I think covers this last one of these last ones. So the question is, is it longer than the ST200? What I'll say is a, a perfectly fit ST200 with a perfectly fit STZ 
I would expect similar distances, maybe a touch more speed out of the Z just because we did thin that face ever so slightly. However, what I think you will see is a larger, a, a higher average ball speed. So when you're getting fit, you're going to see more consistent results. So too many people get stuck on that perfect shot in a fitting where you don't hit that perfect shot on the course every time. So distance shouldn't be viewed as what is the longest it went, what's the fastest it went, what's the furthest it carried. It should be viewed as what's your standard deviation, you know, how consistent is it? And that's where you're really going to start to see the gains in these clubs. I'm going to give you one more. Which would you market as your easier to hit, higher handicap driver? That's a tricky one because it all depends on the player. You know, to me, the easiest to hit one in terms of stability and being the most consistent, it's actually probably the STZ because it is a larger moment of inertia. Uh, if you're a higher handicap who battles a slice, on the other hand, you might benefit more from the X. So, you know, I, I struggle to say pigeonhole this one as the higher handicap or pigeon this one as the better players because they hit, do hit, hit them both if you can hit give them yourself both. the opportunity to find out absolutely brilliant matt anything you want to add to any of those any little angles no i just think i think we've covered everything yeah i mean the, the two heads they they sit perfectly next to each other but they are also perfectly different so you know make sure you don't you don't go in with a narrow-minded i'm just I, I need to solve this let's try that you know, try them both, get some different shafts plugged in and, and, and get fit properly and enjoy your golf some more. Thanks, Matt. Appreciate that. Best of luck out on tour over the rest of the season. And uh, I'm sure we'll catch up again. If, any, if anybody wants to do another two hour session with us three, then I'm sure we'll be available. <laughs> we'll, we'll see what the reaction is to this before we make that decision. Chris, thank you very much. Of course. Uh, conversa conversations that you've had many times, I'm sure. That's okay. I, I love having these conversations because we're talking about fun things. And we'll have to get some new pictures for the wall one of these years. One of these years. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Thank, thanks for checking in. And uh, Chris, we'll, we'll catch up with you maybe in a month or so. Sounds great. Thanks, All Matt. Right. Thanks, thanks very much, guys. Appreciate that. Bye.